Hello, everyone. Would you Thanks so much to all of you for being here today. My name is Caden Fabi. I am the policy manager with Mentor. I'll be your host, and it's an honor to be with you all today. I'm also a mentee and a mentor myself. And when I think about the topic that we're discussing today, I think about my days in college when I was stressed with multiple jobs and responsibilities and trying to figure out who I was and how lucky I was to have access to someone who cared about and listened to me. And now I get to be a mentor myself. And my mentee, Quandell, excitedly shared with me uh, the other day when he hopped in my car that he's getting straight A's and B's right now. So I thought I'd shout him out really quick. Um, but we're here today to learn and talk about one of the most important issues of our time. And that's how we support the mental health of our young people. We believe that all of us have a part to play. And of course, mentors are not mental health professionals, and there's no question that we need to invest in building our mental health workforce in schools and communities now. We also know that we can intentionally build relationships into our day-to-day -day work that supports positive youth development and well-being, and we're going to unpack that further today. Just a reminder, some logistical things. Uh, we do have ASL and CART services available. Uh, you can pin uh, Tara if you'd like to. Um, and we also have, you also have the ability to turn on live captioning. Please use the chat and the Q&A feature to ask questions and we'll do our best to get to them live, but no promises because we have a jam-packed agenda today. Um, and as part of that jam-packed agenda, you'll be hearing from mentors, from mentees, from program leaders, from researchers, and more about their unique perspectives on this issue. So we're gonna cover a lot over the next hour and maybe an extra five minutes or so, but all attendees will receive a recording of this event. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Representative Mary Gay Scanlon from Pennsylvania's fifth district. Representative Scanlon is the chair of our Youth Mentoring Caucus and our biggest congressional champion for mentoring on Capitol Hill. And quick plug, if you're a congressional staffer and your boss is not a part of our growing caucus, please contact Faith and Representative Scanlon's office. We would love to have you on board. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Representative Scanlon. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone at Mentor and all our panelists for joining us today. I am Mary Gay Scanlon. I represent Pennsylvania's fifth district, which includes part of Philadelphia, as well as suburban counties, Delaware and Montgomery County. Um, look, even before the pandemic, we know that young people were struggling with feelings of helplessness, depression, and even suicidal thoughts, and that it had reached alarming levels, the stress of modern life, um, you know, just so much going on in our worlds. And that was before COVID-19 dramatically altered young people's experiences at home, at school, and in their communities. So now we're dealing with another level of grief along with escalating violence in those communities. Um, we know that as a result of COVID, more than 200,000 American children lost a parent or caregiver um, at the school that I used to mentor. It was above 50% of the students had experienced such a loss. Um, we've seen young people have had to watch their families struggle with financial instability, food shortages, housing insecurity. Um, everyone is spending too much time on social media, being bombarded with messages that are often of questionable uh, accuracy, but also can be devastating to people's self-esteem. Um, young people have been separated from crucial support networks and seen horrifying upticks in violence at schools, at playgrounds, and on the streets of their neighborhoods. And certainly the 
region that I um, represent has not been immune from it, as no region has been immune from it. So as we look at solutions to help support young people, we can't underestimate the impact of caring and supportive mentors on a young person's emotional and mental well well-being. I mentioned the school I, I started a mentoring program at Constitution High School in Philadelphia, and we saw a positive effect on mentee self-esteem and interpersonal relationships, um, academic and career outcomes. So as a mentor, I still hear regularly from students who participate in that program, whether about charting their next career steps or navigating the challenges of young adulthood. I even had one student contact me over the last year trying to help his mom navigate whether to get a COVID vaccination or not. Her job required it, but she was nervous. We were able to help him help his family navigate those decisions. So I know how meaningful mentoring relationships can be both for young people needing guidance and for the mentors themselves. So many of us face mental health challenges throughout our lives and mentors can help youth cope with these struggles and support their mental well-being through educational attainment, skills training, career exposure, and identity development. And mentors can also help recognize when struggling young people need additional support and then help them find appropriate resources and healthcare professionals. So we need to prioritize mentoring relationships and ensure that our schools, community organizations and clinical settings have the tools to work together and help young people cope. And to do that, we have to invest not just in mental health resources, but also in our mentoring programs to ensure that they have the resources to recruit and train mentors who are equipped to support young people through the wide variety of challenges they face, including mental health challenges. So we're trying to increase funding for the Department of Justice's Youth Mentoring Grant. It's the only mentoring specific line item in the federal budget. I'm also interested in exploring additional ways to improve mentor training and recruitment, to promote partnerships between mental health services and mentoring programs, and to research how we can better support our most vulnerable youth through mentoring. So thank you, Mentor, for everything you do. I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion today on how our mentoring programs help young people through mental health challenges and how Congress can support that work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Scanlon. We're so honored and lucky to have you working to expand the mentoring movement in Congress. Um, I'm going to invite folks to introduce yourself in the chat. If you hadn't said hi already, just say hi where you're tuning in from. And we're going to move into our next section here. I'm going to go ahead and introduce David Shapiro, the CEO of Mentor. David couldn't be with us today. And if you know or have seen David speak before, you know that he's very disappointed that he can't be here. Um, but he was able to send us a video. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to David to say hi. bound to happen. Just hang tight. Looks like we're having some uh, technical difficulties, but that's okay. We're gonna go ahead. We'll have David say hi, uh, I think a little bit later on in the briefing, uh, but we'll go ahead and get started, I think, um, with our first panel here. Um, and so I'm gonna invite our panel of mentors to go ahead and turn their cameras on. Um, and I'll introduce you to uh, Sophia Duck is the training and engagement manager with the Mentoring Project of Southwest Pennsylvania and is also a mentor and a coach. And Aaron Ock is a mentor with Worthy Mentoring in Washington, DC. Um, so um, I'm gonna start with a question for Sophia. 
Sophia, not only do you serve as the training and engagement manager for the Mentoring Partnership of Southwest Pennsylvania, but you're also a mentor and a coach of student athletes yourself. We know that there has been an increase in incidence of mental health challenges, in particular for young athletes. Can you just talk a little bit about the unique pressures that young athletes face and how you found success in supporting them as a coach? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to share uh, some of my young people's experiences. So our student athletes are trying to balance the everyday stress of academics, practice and game schedules, community engagement, and they're trying to do this while being perfect at the same time. Um, so as a coach, I've decided to stop telling my young people, push, come on, get through it. You'll be all right on the other side of this and resort it to a place where I have asked them, do you need a break? How do you feel today? Um, I think it's more, and this goes back to what Katie mentioned earlier about just building relationships with our young people. It is more important for me to be a supporter of them than to have them show up to a tournament when they're grieving the loss of a young per uh, another young person in their community due to gun violence or even a family member. Um, it's also more important for me to know that they feel like they can study um, because this is the end of their senior year. They're thinking about testing um, or even prom is an important thing for our young people right now and giving them the grace and the space to do that. Our young people are full of grit and are seen larger than life. But the other side of that coin is that they're also human and they are experiencing these tragedies the same way that we are. Um, so I'll pause because I know there's a lot of other great things that Aaron can share. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Aaron, you've seen how mentoring can impact and support identity development. Please share a little bit about your own experience of having a mentor and how it's created a cycle of you now giving back as a mentor yourself. Sure. Thanks, Caden. And, uh, and Sophia, thanks for that awesome layup. <laughs> um, so in my experience, the two most critical facets of, of mentorship are representation and connection. So those seeking mentorship are often in that position because they've found it difficult to see themselves or a part of themselves in those who would otherwise be supports in their lives, be those family members or coaches or teachers uh, or others. And so seeing an aspect of yourself and someone else is such an essential step in, um, in identity formation and validation. And so the second facet of that is the opportunity to connect with somebody by whom you feel represented and, and seeing somebody is one thing, but having the opportunity to connect with them um, and learn more about them, ask them questions that get at the heart of your anxieties and curiosities, especially as a young person makes a world of difference. And I know it did for me, which I'll share a little bit more about in a second, but equally important is having whoever is in that mentor position, take the time to learn about you. And I think mentors are in a, a better or you know, unique position to make their mentees feel seen and understood, uh, which, is, which is terrific and really an empowering place to be. So the first time I felt as though, you know, I saw my identity as a, as a, as a gay man now and, and boy then represented, um, I was probably 11 or 12, uh, was by a gay couple that was active in our church congregation uh, growing up. And so it was, it was the first time that I saw the church's uh, mission statement as an open and affirming institution get tested, uh, which is profound. Um, and, I, and I didn't really at the time have the vocabulary or sense of self to realize um, that I felt so connected to these people uh, in, in no small part because I was gay, but that representation played a critical role. Um, so after I stopped going to church when I was in high school, I sought, I sought out this couple for additional guidance on how to navigate some of the challenges I um, was experiencing as an adolescent finding his way out of the closet. Um, so understanding them as people, uh, having the opportunity to probe it further and you know, not just as the, not just understanding them as the, as the gay couple at church that I saw uh, was once again, incredibly empowering. All of a sudden I felt like I could be, I could be gay and many other things um, as cliche as that might sound today. 
So in the story that I just shared, there's a lot of really good fortune involved. Uh, I, um, <clears throat> I, I, I know that a lot of people don't have the same opportunity to as organically connect with those, uh, with, with people like the couple that I identified in my story to story a couple of minutes ago. So first I was able to see myself represented. Um, secondly, I had the confidence and resources to, to seek out the kind of people with whom I was interested in connecting. Um, and finally, I wasn't as constrained by, by compounding mental health challenges or adversarial circumstances that would have made it infeasible for me to, to reach out to or follow through on connections with this gay couple. Um, so I now focus primarily on the on the peer mentoring space, you know, largely within an adult community. Um, Caden, you talked a little bit about one of your mentees earlier. I, I have um, one and now a second through Worthy, which is terrific. Uh, both of them I would regard more in my age cohort. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, especially in the LGBTQIA plus community, I think the late youth and early adulthood phase is still really uh, critical for that identity formation. Um, but also I, I focus on this space because I'm not as plugged into uh, the other resource ecosystems um, that, that I feel like I would need in order to provide youth with the support that they would need. And so that makes the provision of additional resources all the more important for those working to serve younger communities. And so, you know, it, it, as we think about establishing better supports and interventions for mental health challenges and facilitating a healthy identity formation from an early point, um, that really does require us to meet uh, those seeking this kind of connection where they are, um, as, as, opposed to, as opposed to imposing the burden on them to seek out some of that connection. And so for us to really meet the mental health moment we're in, um, I, do, I do believe that we need to lower the, the barriers to and costs of accessing those services. So thank you everybody for being here today. I'll turn it back over to you, Kaden. Yeah, Aaron, thank you so much for sharing your powerful story. Um, I have just one more question that I'll pose to both of you. Um, as people who care about your mentees, you and talk to them regularly, you may notice when their mental health, health is going south. So what comes next after you notice that happens? Yeah, so I can jump in here. Uh, so as a coach, we like to begin our practices with a circle. And that's a way that I can kind of gauge what's going on, how the young people are responding to us, how they even came into the gym. Um, and as part of that circle, I can hear, oh, it's testing week, or um, like I mentioned, prom produced a lot of anxiety for our young people. Uh, so just thinking about what I'm seeing all at that circle, but then also in drills. And the first thing that I just want to share is what Aaron was just mentioning is just support. What does it look like? What do they need in that moment? Is it an empathetic air? Do they need to take one of the coaches to the side because they haven't had a chance to vent all day? Um, maybe they haven't had a chance to talk about what happened over the weekend because um, a lot of young people are experiencing things that we're not able to fully address during the school day. Um, so what does it look like to just sit and give them that time? And then the other part of it is what are the professionals or resources that are within the community that I can uh, let them know about? Can I be a, a warm hand off to somebody else? Can I talk to the counselor at the school and say, hey, we want to pay a little bit more special attention to Sophia because this is happening here. Um, but just being supportive. And again, going back to the idea of just building relationships, letting them know that we're there and that we care for them. Um, so Aaron, I'll give you a chance to share. But again, thank you for this time. I, I can't echo that enough. I think it, at the top, you, you talking about some of the situations that you as a mentor, somebody who is attuned to what's going on in their life, know are coming up for them and might, might act as those stressors, I think is critical. And, and that, you know, as a mentor, you, it is really important to check in regularly with those who you're mentoring in order to, in order to be able to anticipate and not just react to the things in their life that might be causing stress. And so, so I think that's the that's in the proactive category. If I do, if I do realize that I'm I'm in a, a moment I was unable to anticipate, um, where where I find a mentee stressed, uh, or or you know facing a, facing a really challenging situation, I think before beginning to engage with that mentee, uh, it's imperative for 
for me and I think other mentors to do a bit of a self check and really rapidly one you know determine what they you know what they can do to maximize their own availability and emotional bandwidth and two you know think through some of their limitations um, that that might that they might run into as they as they get further into conversation with their mentee. Um, so actually, I, I think it's in this step that I, as a mentor, would benefit tremendously uh, from some additional coaching and training on because it's been quite a while and and it was sort of in a previous life that I had um, that I had that training. But I, you know, I haven't gotten as much of that through my current organization. So when I talk about when I talk about some of the you know, some of the barriers to entry and, and costs that mentoring organizations that are maybe just getting started don't think about, it's some of that training overhead. And then the last part that I just wanna hit on is, you know, what, once you start engaging with your mentee, it's about building additional trust from that very first moment. You know, it's it, that, that you see they're in distress. You know, how do I get a sense of where they are, but the aggravating challenges while not requiring them to re-experience the, the situation if they don't want to. I, I think this step requires the most creativity in that, in that I need to be in learning mode as a mentor while also uh, giving them the impression that we're, we're making some headway and, and you know, identifying potential resolution paths. So yeah, you thank so you. much to both of you um, for being here today. I uh, think your mentees are clearly lucky um, to, to be working with you both. So I want to thank you both. We're going to keep this uh, conversation going and we're going to go back and go ahead and share uh, David Shapiro's video, the CEO of Mentor, to say hi. Hi, my name is David Shapiro and I'm the CEO of Mentor. And I want to welcome you to uh, this important briefing today on the intersection of mentoring, of relationship, uh, and healthy development and healthy mental health. First of all, you know, we hear more and more about the youth mental health crisis in the country, whether that's from um, the Surgeon General or the HHS. Um, it is uh, something that when we frame it as a crisis, uh, fear, you know, feels overwhelming. Uh, and yet today we seek to provide perspectives um, from young people uh, to mentors to all across the, the nation, uh, from researchers to practitioners um, and, and, and the like, experts, um, to break down solutions uh, to this crisis um, and some of the positive ways that uh, we can develop pro-social behavior and we can address our mental health in the same way we address our physical health and know uh, that there are things we can do to drive both. And so we acknowledge uh, the importance, the enormity, uh, but we focus on the things we can all be doing to drive connection, to drive relationship, to feel seen, valued, heard, which is really the lifeblood um, of mental health. It's the lifeblood of how we support and invest in uh, our next generation, the now and the future. Um, and we simply want to put mentoring, uh, put volunteers, uh, put relationship in its proper context uh, in the center of this conversation um, about driving positive youth mental health and uh, being there for our young people and meeting them uh, where they're at. Um, we've really tried to uh, you know, center this session as kind of a, a continuity uh, from a plenary topic that we devoted at the National Mentoring Summit, the words of an Olympic athlete, Lori Hernandez, who joined us uh, and talked you know, so powerfully and eloquently about um, how she could you know, thrive and perform in front of millions of folks and then uh, feel despondent and freeze up on a driver's test. But just the way in which our mental health is contextual to our experience, to our trauma, uh, the way in which each of us is, is sort of wired differently and need folks to understand us and meet us where we're at. And, and that um, is really the key uh, to the constant addressing of our, of our mental health um, and our ability uh, to really help our young people thrive and strive and help ourselves uh, also as adult partners and supporters thrive and strive by 
walking a road uh, alongside our young people, discovering with them, discovering new things about ourselves. Um, and so that community, that connection, uh, we really want to talk about today. And, and we really also want to stress that it doesn't happen by accident. It can't be taken for granted. And to address the enormity uh, of what we face and our needing to sort of rethread our civic fabric, fabric and our connection, it's going to take all of us and we feel incredibly fortunate um, and, and to bring you uh, this all-star group of voices, problem solvers, and civic threaders um, to talk about mental health and relationship. Thank you so much to our team for putting this together and to everyone for joining us uh, as we discover one of the most important things going on in America today. Thank you. Thank you so much to David. We're gonna go ahead and turn into our panel of mentees. I'm gonna invite our uh, young people to go ahead and turn on their cameras. Uh, we have Titiana Howard, who is joining us from Minnesota. And we have Gabriel Capella, who is joining us from Puerto Rico today. So I just have a couple questions for you both. Um, and I'll let you, either of you jump in, whoever wants to go first. But the first question we have is just, what are some benefits that you've personally experienced from having a mentor? I can definitely uh, talk a little bit about that if that's okay. Um, when I when I listen to this question, one of the first things that I say is that it's kind of ironic because my mentor is younger than me. He's my best friend, and he's like uh, a year younger than me. But he's really smart, and I really really value all the feedback and all the support that he has given me, especially throughout the last two years. Um, but I would say that mentoring it's literally just being supportive. And it's just a reassurance because a lot of times, majority of the times, um, people, young people that are just feel lost um, or in fear or in doubt of themselves, that's just the doubt. That's what it is, doubt. And for someone to be there and listen to them and literally just say that everything's going to be okay, it means a lot. Maybe it doesn't seem like it means a lot, but for that person, it does mean a lot. Um, and that's one of the things that my best friend always told me, everything's going to be okay. And at the moment I said, like, he's not right. But at the end of the day, everything was just all, was just all right all the time. So that's what I would say. I, I know we have a lot of people in the audience that are not really mentors, but um, I've had both professional mentors and informal mentors, let's say, like my best friend. And I just wanted to say that mentoring, it's you don't have to be a mentor or an educator. Mentoring can be as simple as asking your child, um, how was school today? Asking them and just being open to listening to what they have to say, it, it can be that simple. Um, and you can make a really, really, really strong impact on, on that child because maybe they won't open themselves up to you at the beginning, but if you keep asking and you keep offering yourself, um, they will talk to you eventually about what they're having trouble with or anything that they just want to tell you and they, and they can't find anyone else to tell um, until you ask them. Thank you so much, Gabriel. And I think that peer mentoring is exactly what you just talked about is so important um, and something that we really encourage as well uh, in mentoring and the mentoring movement. Titian, I'll turn it over to you. So any benefits that you've personally experienced from having a mentor? Yeah, so I um, was blessed enough to have multiple mentors in different stages in my life. My first mentor was about 10 years ago um, through an uh, organization, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think the biggest benefit I got from that was just the understanding of not needing to be perfect. And I think that was a huge benefit because she showed me that through her imperfections as well. And I think that is one of the most purest and beautiful things about mentoring in general is that you see it's a growth experience for both the mentee and the mentor um, in different areas in life that you probably wouldn't even understand until you get to a certain stage in your life. I know for me, um, when I met my mentor, she was 22 years old. So she was just graduating from the University of Minnesota. And she was just explaining what life is like being at that age. And I, I really didn't understand it that well. I just thought I was like, okay, well, I mean, this seems fun and interesting. 
fast forward to the future, I'm done with college and now in the real world. And the things that she was saying clicks now and everything makes sense. So I think that's what, excuse me, I think that's one of the biggest benefits is just the life experiences um, that she's taught me. And um, just the, I gained a mentor in that experience, but I left out with the lifelong sister. I just actually finished having lunch with her the other day. So um, that's definitely the biggest benefit I would say I got out of it. Thank you so much for sharing, Titiana. Our next question, I'll pose it to both of you as well. Um, can you talk about how having a mentor has provided support at a time when you needed it? Whoever wants to jump in. Yeah, I can talk a little bit more about that. So uh, it was about a year ago and then I was just heading to college. So um, I go to Providence College. I'm a student there. I'm a rising sophomore now. And I had to move from Puerto Rico. My, well, I was born and raised here. And I had to leave my family behind and all of that. And it was a really hard time. And the first weeks, couple of weeks were hard for me and all that. But I, I talked to my friend, my best friend, and my mentor every single day when I left. Um, and sometimes I didn't even talk to my mom. And I talked to him first. Um, and again, what I remember, he, he uh, every, uh, every single time he told me everything's going to be okay. And eventually you're going to come back. And not only that but you're gonna find your place in college. And that's eventually what happened. And that's something that Tatiana talked about that too, um, that eventually things are gonna click. And if you can just tell the person that you support them and that you're there for them, sometimes they'll ask you something or they'll just bring up something that maybe you don't have an answer for them. And that's okay. Um, if you just listen to them and listen and listen to them, you guys are both going to figure it out eventually and also touching on something that, that Tatiana said as well that the mentor gets something out of the relationship that's true and not only that but in some cases um, the mentor can become the mentee because we all face hardship in our lives and maybe if the, maybe if the person is young even if the person um, that you are mentoring okay the person that you're mentoring may be younger than you but if the table turns around and you are the mentee even if that person is younger than you, they may be up, may be able to help you, and that's the nature of the of the relationship. Just helping both uh, each other out. Yeah, and uh, kind of to add to that, what Gabriel said about the mentor becoming the mentee. I have this one story of uh, my mentor and I did a public um, engagement where we both uh, spoke in front of like a bunch of people, like over a hundred people um, in attendance. And I discovered she had stage fright, but I didn't know this because she would always like push me to like speak in front of people. So I was there like comfortable speaking in front of people. I was like, you got this, you know, you could do this. I believe in you. If you feel like you get lost, just look at me. And so I think that's interesting that uh, what Gabriel said about the mentor becoming the mentee in some cases, because that's, that's definitely true. Um, I say the biggest uh, area of support that my mentor gave me was probably um, the process to college. Um, I, being the first generation in my family to go to college, um, I was the second to graduate in college on my mom's side, like out of probably like the past like five generations, which is, so it was a big thing <laughs> to be a part of. Um, and just the lack of like filling out applications. What did that process actually look like? What is FAFSA? Why do we have to fill out this thing for money type of thing? So um, just understanding that type of importance and getting that guidance through that definitely helped a lot. And I think that was one of the biggest areas that I've got um, help with. And I played sports. And I think what my mentor did for me the most was showing me that you know, your athletic ability, to, your athletic ability does not have to be the reason why you get to college. You could, you, you could utilize other ways. You are just as smart as anyone else in the room to also get there. And she became like so, such a pillar in my life through that experience and through every experience she's been through all of the big, big stages in my life from graduations to getting my first job and stuff like that. So I think the beauty of 
mentoring is that, you know, you like why mentoring is so important and why seeing someone, whether they look like, especially if they look like you in um, different in different stages of life is that, you know, you need to be able to see the life you wanna manifest for yourself and a mentor can literally be that physical um, proof of that life you wanna manifest for yourself. So that's probably the biggest benefit I got from mentoring for sure. So powerful. I want to thank uh, both of our young people for joining us today and being vulnerable and sharing your stories. Um, just thank you so much. We're going to keep this thing going um, and move on to our practitioner panel. Um, and so I'm going to invite our program folks to go ahead and turn their cameras on and I'll do some quick introductions here. We have Dr. Ahada McCummings, who is the Senior National Director of External Affairs and Organizational um, Education for Up to Us Sports. We have Andy Bichelle, who is the CEO and president of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southern Nevada. And we have Sarah London, who is a licensed social worker with the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, similar to our previous panels, I'm gonna go ahead and um, hop in with some questions. Uh, the first one's gonna be for Dr. McCummings. Um, Dr. McCummings, you are a senior director at Up To Us, an organization with the mission of engaging, training, and supporting sports coaches in low-income communities. Can you talk a little bit about the difference that high quality coaches can make in supporting the mental health of young people? Absolutely, thank you, Kaden. Um, so, so a couple ways. I think that what's happened over the past few years with the pandemic and, and uh, racial and social injustice and all of these things that have occurred over the last several years is that we as educators, we as parents, we as decision makers and policy makers have done everything that we can to protect our young people, right? To keep them from hurting, to keep them from feeling certain things, to try to help with their mental health. However, what we've done inadvertently, I think, is that we've stripped away their ability to, number one, be critical thinkers, which then in turn helps them to cope with challenges and struggles. And so in terms of coaching, right, um, coaches who are mentors, who are, who are working with young people, what I believe is that sport imitates life. And some may argue the opposite, that life imitates sports, and it may be a little bit of both. Um, but coaches have the ability, when they understand that mental health is but one dimension of people's overall health and wellness, right? So you have your mental health and wellness, but that's just one piece because you have your physical health and wellness, academic wellness, your social wellness, your uh, environmental wellness, all of these things are interconnected. And so what's unique about coaches and high quality coaches is that they have the understanding that they have the ability to have an effect on every single aspect of their young person's wellness. Um, and so that's what we are trying to teach people that, you know, it's all interconnected. And so when your mental wellness starts to falter, so do some of the other aspects of wellness within your life. Um, and sports is one of those things, one of those areas where you get to intentionally set up situations that mimic life that help young people work through those challenges. You can intentionally put challenges within a practice and then um, you know, ask your young people to overcome that challenge, but you also have the opportunity to make the connection for them about how overcoming that challenge in your sport can mimic overcoming challenges in life. Um, and so that's what I want, especially for those that work with young athletes, is to really take those opportunities and recognize, we heard some of the other panel members talking about how they check in with their, with their young people and their athletes about their academics and what's going on socially with prom and other things. And so you have an opportunity to understand that all of those aspects of your young people's wellness is interconnected and that you have a hand in making sure that your young people are well. 
Thank you so much, Dr. McCummings. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Um, Andy, you've seen success in the mental health programming you implemented at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southern Nevada. Just share a little bit more about these programs and the work that it took to get to this point. Yeah, we we kind of backed our way into it. Um, I had a staff member that got her master's in counseling, and I started a conversation with her on how we could be intentional to bringing you know, licensed uh, assistance to our kids, but also our staff. As you can hear the mentors talking, they're not professionally trained necessarily to do these things. So, so I, I can't fill my club full of licensed professionals and, and, you know, just maintain that budget. But how do we have those skills and those talents in, in the clubs to really be able to do that? And, that started a bigger conversation with our state DHHS, who was looking for an organization willing to um, really bridge a big gap for us in Southern Nevada is transportation to consistent mental health services. So how does a working family get time off to get their kids to uh, mental health services? Uh, by bringing mental health, licensed mental health uh, clinicians into our clubhouses, uh, it eliminates that that aspect of it and provides more consistency around it. And then it was, an, again, an intentional um, practice of putting those licensed professionals and, and doing group counseling that looks just like Boys and Girls Club programming. So clinicians are in Boys and Girls Club shirts and we're doing group counseling first. Um, and really, again, giving those kids the resiliency that they need to deal with anxiety, depression, um, anger management, all those things, but also being making sure that our, our YDPs or our youth development professionals, our staff, sit right next to that um, licensed clinician and learn the language that, that it goes around, for example, um, de escalation of anger, right? So when that manifests itself out on the basketball court we're not running to go get our our uh, our counselor to deal with the situation our our staff is has enough training to be able to identify that this child is having issues with the anger pull them away from the situation have them go through their routine that that de-escalates the situation and then really introduce them back into the group so Again, it's, it was really an intentionality for us to bring that licensed professional into the clubhouse, but really cascade teach to the entire staff so that everybody is working to support those things. And quite honestly, it, it's, it starts with the staff, but it permeates into the club, right? So all of our kids practice that same. The way it was explained to me, youth development, when you see it done right, staff isn't doing anything. Kids are leading the entire process. Um, athletic kid gets to, to lead at the, on the basketball courts or in, in those physical activities. The artistic child gets to lead in the art room. The academic or the, or the technology um, kids get to lead in that department. But, and, and we're constantly moving throughout the clubhouse, but really want to give those kids the opportunity to lead and to follow. How, and how you do both. So they get those resiliency pieces, but we need to model as staff how you communicate with others. What is the social discourse that happens um, to be able to have the environment, the safe environment that you want? And that's really, again, really intentional. To We wanted to bring the, uh, the counselors into the clubhouse to be able to provide that, that baseline that everybody can work off of. Um, and really help the entire group. The, the one thing I will add is the big hurdle for us was, it's great. I want licensed counselors into our clubs. How do I pay for them? That was the other piece. And through, uh, I, again, the relationship with our HHS at the state level, uh, they helped us get credential to bill Medicaid for those, to, to pay those clinicians, to be able to have them for the long-term and create sustainability around that intentional programming. 
Thank you so much for that insight, Andy, and such a unique and important partnership that's making a difference in Southern Nevada, my hometown. Um, Sarah, I'm going to uh, pass the next question to you. You're a licensed social worker for the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and you serve as the violence prevention specialist for the Empowering Teens to Thrive program. Can you talk about how you've been able to successfully integrate mentoring to intervene with and support youth mental health challenges when they've been impacted by community violence? Yes. Well, first, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to bring awareness to the importance of mentorship for our youth who are navigating their uncertain and even traumatic environments um, with so much courage and bravery. Um, our program, Empowering Teens to Thrive, focuses on empowering youth to feel more in control of their well being and confidence by building strength and relationships um, and connections through mentorship. Um, the mentors that we have the privilege to call team members utilize their skill, their familiarity with communities and nurturing characteristics to create a safe and open environment for youth to express their authentic feelings um, when working with our mentors. Um, and so with that, we are providing our mentors with training on how mental health challenges such as anxiety, depression, trauma, and even grief could manifest in the young people that we work with so that they can come alongside the youth um, and help them kind of support their healing process. Um, so this could look like getting connected to mental health treatment. However, for some youth, that's not necessarily their interest, or maybe they've had previous experiences that um, may lead them to not want to choose that type of route. And so we found that building connections and relationships uh, with youth and their families creates this avenue of trust that alone could provide a young person who's experienced community violence um, the opportunity to begin their healing process. Um, and we really come from the lens that our youth are not broken and that they don't need a mental health diagnosis in order to deserve safety and connection. Um, and if our youth are interested in connecting with mental health services, our mentors have direct access and connection to myself, um, in which I then provide uh, like intensive case management and care coordination services in order to help them get connected with the therapeutic support that they deserve. Um, one of our mentors um, of the program or mentees of the program um, who's a survivor of community violence, um, she actually suffered a gunshot wound to her leg um, and she was connected with one of our mentors due to experiencing difficulty in school. And she was receiving a backlash for her injury, um, having difficulty keeping up with schoolwork um, and was just facing adversity when asking for accommodations. And so this really took a toll on her ability to emotionally regulate um, and just experiencing so much overwhelm and stress when she had just survived the most traumatic event in her life. And so our program kind of stepped in along with our mentor and created this connection with her and relationship in order to help mom who was serving as her incredible advocate, but support mom as well um, in advocating for this young woman's need to be in a more supportive environment for education. Um, and that's, that's a direct example of what we're able to provide and level of support. And um, the youth that we have the privilege to work with um, and serve are strong survivors of trauma. Um, and we're here to support their healing process, however that looks. Um, but yes, yeah, so thank you again for the opportunity to share what our program has brought to our communities. Thank you so much to all three of you for sharing the amazing programming um, that you're doing to support young people in your community. It's really clear that you're running successful, impactful programs for young people. Um, Next question, I'm gonna ask everyone to be quick. Um, uh, we're running a little bit behind on time, but we wanna get through everything, but wanna ask about resources and um, what resources does it take to be successful? And if you could wave a magic wand and resources were not a concern, how would you expand your work in this space? I'll go ahead and, and answer that question. Um, if I had a magic wand, number one, um, resources for us would mean dollars. Um, dollars to be able to put more coaches and more mentors on the ground to be able to work with young people. Um, that's, that's the ultimate um, goal for us is that we continue to empower young people. Um, and when I'm talking about youth, I'm talking about our mentors as well. Many of them are considered youth as well. And so to be able to give them the information um, so that they can have some personal awareness about their own mental wellness, 
um, but then also be able to help the young people that they work with have some self-awareness about themselves as well, um, I think is the key. And so, um, you know, right now in our space, what's important is that we bring awareness to, um, to what mental health and wellness is. Um, we are not, as, as coaches, looking to provide counseling um, for young people. We leave that to the clinical people. I think it's important that organizations understand that, that if you are not clinical people, you are not supposed to be diagnosing or offering any of those type of, types of clinical um, services. We leave those to people, uh, you know, like Sarah, to, to do that type of stuff. Um, but we do want to raise awareness and make it, um, we all are dealing with challenges, every one of us. And so we want to normalize the fact that everyone deals with challenges, with mental challenges at some, at some point in their lives. And we want people to have the tools to be able to work through those challenges. Um, and so that's what I would say, give us some dollars so we can put more young people out here to support young people. Thank you so much, Dr. McCummings. I'll turn it over to Andy. Yeah, just in this, I'd like to have a wand for a lot of different things, but in this particular case, um, really about the challenges of accessing Medicaid have, I mean, we've been at this almost three years um, and, and still are learning the process. So to disencumber the, the processes and, and, and again, we don't know what we don't know. What levers are we not uh, pulling? And, and again, our state DHHS is really helping us through this process. But um, again, we've been at this three years and it feels like a lifetime to me. And everybody else is telling me that we're moving at light speed with, with the Medicaid process. So uh, just to unencumber some of the, the processes around and, and even once you get through that Medicaid hurdle, then you're starting to deal with managed care organizations. Um, and, and anybody in healthcare knows that's, that's a whole nother web that you have to dig through to really get to the support we need to provide the, the services we all know our kids need, right? So how do we, how do we not have to have these large admin departments to be able to manage this, you know, complicated funding source. Um, and, and, and I think if we can get it a little less complicated, more, more organizations will jump into this process and really, again, provide the support that, that we need for our kids. Thank you so much, Andy. And I'll turn it over to Sarah. Um, yeah, so I would agree with uh, Dr. McCummings. I think that the populations that we get to serve and work with, um, they're expensive. And it's expensive for a reason because there's people that want to do the work um, who deserve also to be compensated for the amount of time that they are putting into this. So like paying our mentors to be able to work with the young people um, and utilize a skill that comes naturally to them um, and emphasize their strengths and paying them for their strengths is something that our program emphasizes. And so that's something that um, is always in need of is funding for these types of programs because there's people who want to do them um, and they deserve to be compensated for their efforts. I want to thank all three of you uh, for being here today, for sharing the incredible work that you're leading in your communities. Um, we're going to keep this thing going, but uh, we'll make sure that folks can contact you if they have additional questions about what you shared. Um, so we're going to go into our next section here, um, and I'm going to introduce Janine Godsey, who works as a consultant with the Black Mental Health Alliance for Education and Consultation, which was founded in 1984 with the mission of developing, promoting, and sponsoring trust, trusted culturally relevant educational forums, trainings, and referral services that support the health and well-being of Black people in their communities. Janine, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Caden, um, um, for inviting you know myself on behalf of Black Mental Health Alliance to be present. So I know we're short on time, and so when Caden and I were in communication, you know, I was asked to just share about the acute, I guess you could say, like the acute mental health crises impact 
on Black youth and maybe just kind of also highlight how mentoring and relational supports and programs can support. Um, first, I want to share um, that I think it was on the um, youth panel, the mentee panel, excuse me, um, where it was mentioned about how parents and guardians can also be mentors, right, and in essence, an influencer in a young person's life. So as I reflect on that, it caused me to wonder, like, even more about the various socially engineered traumas um, to include racial discrimination that has interrupted families and communities from being able to support the young people within the community and thus has led to such a large uh, surge in needing more mentors to ensure young folks and thus ask for more public dollars. And so it, as I reflect on um, this statement of also around the acute mental health issues for Black youth, I began to wonder like, well, how do we define, what does acute mean? And it means like severe or sudden onset. So what I will share is that many of the life events that are being discussed have been in existence and efforts to address those life events and the manner in which they impact mental health and wellness for black youth has already been occurring. Um, however, oftentimes um, the dollars are not funded, funneled to people who are actually boots on the ground, who also look like the young people um, and who are incorporating various types of practices that are unique to their cultural identity. Um, so I think that is important for us to keep in mind. Um, what I will also say is like, well, what supports would be needed to address the mental health and wellness um, for Black youth in particular? I, of course, we know more support is needed, but I think it really starts with the mentors, the leaders of the organization, um, as well as board members that sit on those organizations to undergo various types of professional development and training that introduce them to what socially engineered traumas are compared to just life events, right? Um, the loss of a parent is a, is a traumatic situation, right, for many. However, the manner in which you lose that parent, if it's by way of medical apartheid because they weren't listened to as a Black woman when they went to the, the doctor, or they were the recipient of police brutality simply because they were walking while Black, that is a socially engineered trauma compared to a traditional trauma. So I think that there needs to be some form of training, professional development, um, for, thank you for that 90 second um, reminder. It needs to be some kind of training and professional development that exposes mentors, leadership within those organizations, their board members to what socially engineered traumas are, um, such as dehumanization of black people, adultification of black youth and how that has played a part in, um, I think it was the Central Park um, gentlemen that were wrongfully incarcerated. Um, in addition to that, um, I think that it needs to start there. And secondly, reallocating public dollars to organizations that are boots on the ground, that are possibly even, you know, um, African-centered if they're working with Black youth or they are doing the work in the community, but they often do not get the money. So that is what I think should happen instead of um, giving the money to other individuals. Um, and we have to examine the historical context on what has taken place and how we handle Black bodies and how it might be occurring in today. So that's what I would offer up. More money is needed, but it's a matter of where we actually reallocate those dollars. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Janine, for that absolutely critical and important perspective. Um, we um, are gonna go ahead and I'm gonna invite Jim Warren to join us. Jim is the CEO of Warrior Society Development and the USC Center for Disabilities, or USD Center for Disabilities, and is gonna offer a critically important perspective for us as well. So um, Jim, I'll invite you to turn your camera on um, and to join us. Hi there, it says that I'm unable to start video because host has stopped it. So I got I'm you. <laughs> So it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, hopefully uh, I'll be able to uh, set up my little background I have for you today. I'm actually in New York. Oh, here we go, start my video, okay. So greetings from New York City. I'm actually out here for uh, film festivals. I'm a filmmaker as well. So we just won uh, honorable mention for my last film at the People's Film Festival in Harlem. And now I'll be at Tribeca opening tonight, and then my film shows at the Manhattan Film Festival Friday. So it's a wonderful to be able to share a Native perspective in the United States of America. And I like the fact that one of the mentees said, finds their place, because in none of our indigenous languages here in America, none of our Native languages has a term for disability. So finds their place is one of our terms that we use for addressing disability and mentor youth services. 
So uh, mentor impact is multi-generation, uh, multi-generational as many uh, share today. And so is trauma as people address. Obviously we have uh, multi-generational, intergenerational historical trauma challenges for our youth, as well as our population as a whole. When you think that America was formed as a result of uh, over 90% elimination of indigenous people, that is rarely taught in America. So again, when you think of a over 90% elimination of a population, obviously multi-generational trauma will occur. And as an old has-been athlete, thank you to the coaches and mentors, that's what coaches are, are truly mentors and educators providing an example for young people to strive to get better in whatever their dreams may be. So I had many educators and mentors in my life that I'm very fortunate to have had as an athlete and uh, had some experience as a professional football player. So I do a lot of camps and life skills and athletic camps for native youth throughout the country. One of the one things that is very uh, impactful for our youth back home on Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota is every day a youth attempts suicide. So today, one of our young ones is attempting suicide as we speak. So that's something where we have the highest rate of suicide. And when you think of the life expectancy of native people in South Dakota, uh, the life expectancy for general South Dakotans is 81. For uh, tribal members is 54. On my reservation, Pine Ridge, it's 47 for Indian men. So if anyone was concerned, that would be a public health crisis. Unfortunately, America is not concerned because they're not doing much in terms of, for instance, funding and resources. Indian Health Service, everyone goes, oh, Indians get free health care. Well, it's funded at 60% capacity. So whenever I uh, talk to congressional leaders, I say, please fund us equally to federal prisons. Because as of now, federal prisons get double the amount of health care per prisoner as compared to tribal member through Indian Health Service. So please, Congress, at least fund us equally to prisons, or it would be wonderful to be up there with veterans, Medicaid, Medicare, but there are four to five times more per patient. So when you think of that systemic issue, that leads to more challenges for our youth that are struggling every day with suicide and just trying to survive in many of our communities in Indian country. So when you think of adverse childhood effects, they're checking off all those boxes and we need to do what we can to provide them the mental health resources and supports for our tribal members, the first Americans, if you wanna say, in terms of why are we forgotten in this overall general health care and approach to mentorship and uh, providing adequate services to our young ones. So as uh, one of my mentors, my mom, she's still, she's 83 and still teaching nursing. So she's still out there making a difference for Indian country. And it's our allies, our non-Indian brothers and sisters like yourselves, who we need to join us and to bring attention to Indian country issues. So Palami Awashtelo, thank you so much for all you do for those young ones, those future generations that we all have a responsibility to not only represent, but give them opportunities to succeed. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim, for those important and wise words. We so appreciate you being here today. We have just a couple of very quick, short sections left of our time today. Uh, we have a research section before I'm gonna go over some policy asks. So um, I am gonna invite Dr. David Dubois to uh, turn on his camera. Um, he is the Associate Dean for Research and a professor with the University of Illinois Chicago. And one of, if not the uh, most renowned uh, uh, researcher in the mentoring field. And we're so honored to have you join us today. David, I'll um, go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Caden, and uh, it's really been a, a pleasure to be uh, part of this panel and an honor to get a chance to contribute uh, to, to this session, I should say. I found you know, everything shared so insightful and enlightening and, and, and inspirational in, in, many, in, in so many respects. Um, I won't belabor uh, what uh, Representative Scanlon so well articulated at the start of this session, but to briefly put some specific numbers to the mental health needs that exist today um, and have for a long time in, 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 in large measure for our young people. One in five at any one time will meet criteria 
when you go about trying to create some line for diagnosis of an actual, you know, mental health disorder, as it's called, that the language is not ideal, um, but really challenges or concerns that rise to the level of, uh, you know, experts feeling that, you know, treatment and, and, and supports are needed. Um, that is two to three times higher for youth who are experiencing socioeconomic disadvantage in their families and or neighborhoods. So that's really, I think, just something to, to keep in mind in all this. And of course, many of those youth also being youth of color um, to, to the remarks that were just made. Um, we know that mental health uh, treatment can be helpful. Uh, we also know that those from those disadvantaged uh, uh, backgrounds have a lot of uh, obstacles um, placed in front of them to, to, to benefiting from that uh, around access, uh, sustaining engagement once there is access. Uh, and there's some evidence that the effectiveness of, of what is offered may not be at the same level as it is for, for youth from, from other uh, life cir circumstances. And of course, none of this addresses the issue of prevention of hopefully avoiding uh, youth uh, as much as possible from getting to the point where, where treatment uh, is, is a needed option. So um, where does mentoring fit in? I, I think, uh, Caden, if you can share, yeah, thank you. My humble effort at a, um, if we can go to slideshow, Caden, that would be great. I don't know if that you can do that. If not, that's no problem. Um, so, uh, as I just addressed, mental health services are important, right? So there's no, uh, no question about that. However, um, we have good evidence, um, and I really give a shout out to Mentor on their uh, fact sheet uh, brief on, on mentoring and mental health. I just A plus from this professor in terms of really capturing the evidence and the takeaway insights. Um, so I really refer you to that but I'll try to put some highlights onto, onto what that research tells us or uh, is pointing us toward. So first of all, uh, mentoring can be in, and has evidence of being its own benefit apart from or in addition to mental health services. So in one uh, study that I was fortunate enough to be a part of, uh, we, we looked at a program called Great Life Mentoring. And in this program, all the youth involved are receiving outpatient mental health services, and they all are kind of Medicaid eligible from, from, from uh, lower income families. Uh, and uh, so our comparison of those who were receiving the mentoring uh, through Great Life Mentoring and those who, who were not, they were all receiving high quality mental health uh, services. And yet when we looked at over time, how their own therapists were, because that was the data we had access to, rating their overall functioning and ability to hopefully thrive, not just avoid you know, major difficulties in, in getting along school, peer relationships, their own emotional well-being. We saw, and if you can go to the next slide, if it's possible, it may be a little tricky. You have to go through all the animation. I'm sorry, Caden. Um, but if, yeah, yeah, so you can see here quickly because no professor's remarks would be complete without a graph, right? So you see here, um, that at the point of intake through the start of mentoring, because uh, they're not referred immediately, the therapist sees the need and then refers them uh, at some point during treatment, which is typically long-term, um, there was uh, actually a trend for the, um, the comparison group, uh, we're actually looking a little better, but just to say they, they weren't looking any worse. And then after that, as you followed the two groups for two years, you see the darker line of the Great Life Mentoring mentored youth, um, um, having significant uh, increase in how therapists saw them functioning and, and a decline over time for the, uh, the youth who, who were uh, not in the program. So we can go back if we could. Um, one of the things that I want to comment with regard to, 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 to that example is that, uh, and to underscore this, high quality mentoring. So when you go into Great Life Mentoring, uh, you receive 20 hours of training about healthy relationships. And, and this is not light stuff. This is about how we go about relating to others in the world. It's not about learning about mental health disorders and what kind of treatment techniques you can support and add to 
with your, it's really just about the core of who we are as people uh, and how we, uh, how we manage our own emotions and, and behavior in particularly in relation to our, to our social world. Um, and uh, so a simple exercise that might seem simple would be, okay, we're gonna practice active listening skills. So everybody, I want you to listen for three minutes to your partner without saying anything. <laughs> for me, that would be very difficult. For many, it is. But those are serious, solid, you know, important skills. We, we have to have mentors get support and training and, and bringing into the relationships as much as they may have many natural aptitudes and they certainly do. There's always work to be done on in terms of who you are and mentoring is a very operational dependent, uh, operator dependent uh, enterprise. Um, uh, so in another study, uh, which also goes to, to, the, to the, the value add of mentoring, this was primarily Big Brothers Big Sisters programs which both these programs, by the way, use rank and file uh, volunteers in the community, no special degree requirements or educational background uh, requirements, anything like that. These are folks who are willing to step up and uh, go through the experience of being screened and trained uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and then, you know, make a commitment to, 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 to be a support for a young person. So um, in the Big Brothers Big Sisters uh, study, we found that over one third of the youth, and it was about five, 600 youth in, in this study, uh, met uh, over or above a cutoff that's predictive of having clinically significant depressive symptoms. So it was 37%, so it was really remarkable. We also found that by both the youth and their parents report that they looked significantly better after uh, 13 months of mentoring compared to a group that, you know, to do a rigorous study, was a waitlist group, which was offered mentoring after the 13 months. And you might say, well, what's going on here? What, what is actually benefiting uh, young people if it's not this kind of more formal treatment? Uh, time's up, oh my goodness. Okay, is that true? <laughs> I have my timer on and I think- we'll, we'll let you finish, don't worry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, how much time though should I take? Because I don't want to go over what you need. Say so maybe maybe another two minutes. Okay, maybe. two minutes. <laughs> um, uh, two minutes it is. Um, and, and so um, uh, one of the things I'm a clinical psychologist by training, if, if an adult or a young person comes in and is depressed, the script we write, we don't write it out, is pleasant activity scheduling. <laughs> Find things you enjoy doing and, and do them and see how your mood goes. Things that you might have put to the side or, or have had not been making the time to, to do. Well, who's better equipped to go do enjoyable things with, uh, which typically is the therapist, when, when they come back in, adult or child, the next week, oh, I forgot, or here's three reasons I didn't do that, versus the mentor being a kind of companion in that process, right? So there are things that are not highly technical, but are right in the wheelhouse of a, of a, of a mentor to do. Um, and I just wanted to call out these radiating effects here. And I know I've you know, just got a short period of time, but we have good evidence that youth who receive mentoring can then pay those benefits forward to their peers, to their family, uh, and to communities. So I'm gonna give a shout out. I saw my... <laughs> Just esteemed colleague Liz Miller happens to be here in the uh, in the audience, and I already had planned to mention a program that she has just done, you know, tremendous groundbreaking work with called Coaching Boys into Men. Young male athletes at middle school or high school level have these conversations for, with their coaches, with guided you know cards and tips on how to have them about healthy relationship skills, how you go about, especially in situations of dating or things that would have any kind of romantic overlay to them, of course, brewing up at that age in, 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 in spades, following that over time, those schools where those athletes were trained up were having less sexual harassment uh, in, in, a, in a kind of abusive kinds of behaviors going on uh, on the part of, of um, of the, you know, the athletes who were mentored, right, relative to schools that didn't get the training. Other, just real quickly, I'll end on this, along with benefits we see radiate to parental stress, 
We also have really great programs to, to give a shout out. I think it was Gabrielle and, and Tatiana. I may be getting my, my names uh, mixed up around peer mentoring, the uh, sources of strength trains up with adult mentoring young people who are identified as informal in, informal leaders uh, to about mental health first aid and they go and are ambassadors in their schools again randomly assigning schools to get or not get this you see more awareness of and referrals to mental health services um, uh, and, and this is you know particularly around suicide prevention so you know the ultimate you know, you know concern we would have and so let's not forget, that there are these radiating effects that when we are touching uh, young people with high quality mentoring, it's not just them, but others in their orbit who are, who are benefiting, which includes all of us. Thank you so much, Dr. Dubois. Um, I think this sets us up perfectly for our closing here. Um, I would be remiss as our policy manager at Mentor if I didn't talk about some of our policy asks that we're looking at um, and ways that we can um, increase funding to these programs doing this really critical work. Um, and we'll end on this. You know, this is, I already said this before, but this is clearly one of the most important issues to address of our time. And it's on every single one of us to do our part. At Mentor and in the mentoring movement, we believe that mental health problems and community violence are preventable. And through our policy priorities, we're attempting to legislate care and love and community and acceptance for our young people who don't get as much as they require or deserve. When we invest in mentoring programs, we're investing in all of these things, all of these qualities. But unfortunately, our most recent data suggests that the average wait list is 63 young people for a given program, which is indicative of a shortage of resources. We're very proud of the OJGDP Youth Mentoring Grant, which is the singular funding stream specifically for mentoring in the federal budget. It was funded at $102 million in fiscal year 22, which was a $2 million increase. And our movement is calling for $130 million for fiscal year 23. This grant also funds the National Mentoring Resource Center, which provides free training and technical assistance to anyone who requests it. Um, but we don't believe that OJJDP should be the only agency that's investing specifically in mentoring. We're calling for sources of funding through other agencies in the government so that there is a mentoring mindset expanded into the workplace, into schools, and into any place where adults work with young people. Um, Mentor supports the Foster Youth Mentoring Act, the Youth Workforce Readiness Act, the Transition to Success Mentoring Act, and the Mentoring to Succeed Act. We'll make sure that you all get bill numbers for those. Um, if you're not already on these bills, we encourage you to, to sign on as a co-sponsor. You can contact me for more information and we'll follow up with additional details. Um, we're also interested in demonstration and pilot programs through agencies like DOL, ED, HHS, to explore and evaluate unique partnerships and models, some of which you heard about today, between or within professional helping institutions like schools and clinics for those who need those lower level or light interventions. And additional research funding is also needed on mentoring delivered to specific groups who are facing risk or who have faced particular traumas, such as losing a parent to COVID-19. If you're interested in talking more, please contact me. Um, I'll be in touch and you'll be hearing from me in general for follow-up materials, but I wanna thank all of our amazing panelists, our program leaders and researchers who are doing the work on the ground, our mentor, mentors who are giving their time and especially to our young people uh, for sharing their stories today. I also wanna encourage everyone listening to become a mentor. It's an invaluable experience and mutually beneficial. Mentor runs the Mentoring Connector, which is a free and the largest database of thousands and thousands of mentoring programs across the country. You can find that on our website at mentoring.org. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Let's continue this conversation. Happy Wednesday and be well.